we, whenever you're ready, you can start the presentation and I'll kind of continue with the intro. Um, awesome. The, so just for background, uh, earlier this year, the council established a housing committee to look at housing in Freeport and basically promote it, get more housing in Freeport. Um, I'll, they're going to run the bulk of the presentation, so I'll let them get into the details of who they are and what they've done. Uh, but we recognize it's an issue. We wanted to see what solutions there are. Uh, so we've asked for some recommendations. They provided some recommendations, uh, which are printed out on the table and back, if you don't have them already, to the same ones that came up at our last council meeting. Um, and that's the impetus for the discussion tonight. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with housing beyond just these recommendations. Um, but that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Uh, this is not an official meeting where we expect to vote on anything. So nothing is going to get finally decided tonight. Tonight's a discussion to figure out what direction we want to go in. If we do want to make changes to ordinances, rules, how things are, that would require a public meeting, uh, like a council meeting or a planning board meeting, uh, and a public hearing. So we would invite the public again if we have a specific recommendation that we want to act on. So we are not here to act on anything tonight, we're just here to discuss. Um, with that, any questions? If there's anybody on the housing committee or other boards that isn't up here, you're welcome to join us up here in the front row or at the table. Um, Anything I forgot for background? No. Um, all right. Yes. Um, to start with, what we can do is we'll go around the table, make sure everybody knows who we are. So do introductions for everybody uh, up front here. Uh, I forgot to mention I'm Dan Pilch. I'm the chair of the town council. Uh, and uh, we'll go around this way, and I'll ask everybody up here to introduce themselves. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Uh, Brett Richardson, Executive Director of the Freeport Economic Development Corporation. Caroline Pelletier, Town Planner and Interim Town Manager. Rosemary Burwell, um, Town Planning. <clears throat> Chip Lawrence, District 4. Linda Berger, Project Review Board. Lynn Hamlin, Project Review Board. Fred Madeira, Project Review Board. Ed Bradley. Town Councilor, District 2. Chris O'Neill, a Housing Committee. Mari Mia, Housing Committee. John Egan on the Town Council. Mitch Ruda, Planning Board and Housing Committee. Jake Daniele, Town Council. Matt Pillsbury, District 3. And Todd Yankee, Project Review Board. Do you want to join us up here? Can I convince you to join? Um, all right. And, and I'm Ford Reiki, chair of the Project Review Board. Thanks, everybody. I'm not talking tonight. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> all right. What, uh, what's up next? Freeport Housing Task Force. Uh, John, do you want to do an intro to this, or Mitch, whoever is the chair of the housing task force, just to set some background? Okay, I wasn't prepared for this. Yeah, but okay. So, um, John, uh, the, the, as part of the, I think it's important to go back to the Freeport Vision Plan, which talked a lot about what to do in downtown, and came to a, a broad consensus across the community that more housing, particularly in downtown, would be advantageous to the community. Um, a number of projects have been uh, proposed and are in various stages of uh, going forward or not uh, in, in downtown and outside downtown. But a sort of a second background would be that uh, it's relatively broadly perceived that uh, housing prices for rental and buying are higher and higher and exclude big portions of our population. 
And so with that background, uh, the town council asked that a housing committee be established to just uh, advise. And we have a group of seven of us, I think, with relatively uh, varied background. Uh, I work in agriculture today, but I have an architecture and development background. Chris O'Neill has a development background. Uh, Vanessa uh, Farr uh, is on the, uh, uh, from the principal group and also a resident of Freeport and very uh, astute, under, uh, good understanding of um, how uh, ordinances can affect development. Uh, Matt from the um, uh, Freeport Housing Trust, uh, Maya from the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mari <laughs> from the uh, uh, diversity community, social, uh, social, social Oh, it's right here. I should be reading off of here. Social Ra Racial Equity Committee. So um, good uh, perspective from across the community. And then Brett from the Freeport Housing Trust, uh, from the Freeport Economic, FEDC, sorry. Is that? Now, now, now I'm sure that Brett is going to take over. <laughs> so uh, we've got a presentation. We're going to share a few slides. Um, to give you a sense for some of the market data that informed how we thought about housing development as a committee. We were lucky enough to have an intern from the Muskie School at USM help with some of this, Carolyn McLeod. She's in a car driving to Tacoma right now, but she sent this in from the road. So um, this gives you a sense for the cost of housing if you're gonna purchase a house. This data is from 2022. Uh, the top right, there's a lot of information on this slide, so uh, bear with me, but the top right, uh, first tier, second tier, third tier, uh, what we did was we broke the purchase prices into tiers, uh, one through three, and then created uh, an average um, cost for each tier, and then from that cost, using some assumptions, extrapolated the type of down payment you would need um, the type of uh, mortgage that you would have to bear, and then uh, the type of income that you would need to support that mortgage using 30% of your income, which is sort of the golden rule around affordability is that you should be able to afford your home uh, with 30% of your income, leaving 70% for the rest of, of life. And so this, this gives you a sense, this is from 2022, so probably a little conservative at this point. Uh, but we did use 7% interest, so this, that's a little bit uh, more towards 2023 to give you a sense for what it might be. Um, and you can tell, uh, the, the, this includes uh, condos, mobile homes, and single family homes. It doesn't include uh, commercial multifamily. Uh, but the lower tier, the average purchase price was 315 grand, uh, which means you need a down payment at 20% uh, of 63,000 bucks, and then uh, an income to uh, support that mortgage of about 85 grand a year. Uh, moving up to the second tier, uh, close to 600 grand purchase price, uh, 100 and, almost 120,000 bucks down, and then uh, you know a pretty substantial income, 156,000 bucks, and then going up to the next tier, uh, over a million, 1.1 million down payment, uh, 221,000 bucks. And then, you know, it's a pretty significant uh, mortgage payment and um, need to make close to 300 grand to be able to support that with 30% of your income. So that gives you a sense for the market of housing in Freeport. Next slide. Uh, next few slides are gonna show uh, price points relative to workforce. There's about 150 positions that are currently open in Freeport. You can see uh, the columns, the, the y-axis, uh, shows how many of the positions are open at those different wage levels. So the 12 to 18 hour on the far left, there's close to 50 positions open. Moving to the right, 18 to 24 bucks an hour. Uh, you got you know 60 positions, and then moving down uh, to the right, they get lower as the wage goes up and the skill set becomes more specialized. Uh, next slide. This uses those same uh, blue bars. So again, far left, 50 positions. 12 to 18, moving to the right, 60 positions, um, 20 to 28, I think it was. It gives you a sense. These red lines, they're a little bit confusing. There's a lot of information, but what that does is place 
uh, a prevalent occupation on that X axis. So the, the far left, using that magical 30% of income, a uh, person making 12 to 18 bucks an hour, 30% of their income would support a, a monthly housing payment of 500 to 750 bucks a month. Uh, moving to the right, 750 uh, to 1,000 bucks a month for the average um, retail worker at L.L. Bean. Uh, you know, first year police officer can afford uh, 1,000 to 1,250. And, um, and you know, the average town employee uh, about 1,500 bucks a night, the, anecdotally, or a month. Anecdotally, there's almost no town employees that live in town, can't afford it. Uh, and then moving out to the right, you can see the median household income as well. So that's, that's um, a distribution of prevalent open occupations in Freeport and what they can afford. The next slide is gonna show this relative to available units. So it, it's hard to see, but you can see those smaller orange columns to the right. Those are placed on the x-axis uh, around what the price point is per month for those units. And then on the x-axis, how tall they are shows how many units are available. Uh, so you can see, you know, a first-year police officer uh, isn't going to be able to, to afford uh, to live in Freeport on their own. Um, that retail worker, not a chance. And then moving to your right, um, there's a little bit of overlap there. But for the vast majority of the open occupations, which are representative of the folks who live in, or work in Freeport, uh, it's pretty hard, uh, tough sledding to find a place to live in Freeport at a price point that you can afford. Right. So th the numbers on the bottom are dollars, a household income, or that's good. Income? Good question, John. So that x-axis is uh, monthly rent. So uh, you can see 500 to 750 on the far left. That's a third of a person who makes 12 to 18 bucks an hour, and then the I think it's the fourth bar that represents a first-year police officer. There's that 1250 to 1500, uh, and then moving to the right. So the point left to right orients you to how much they can afford and what the available units are available for. And then the vertical for the blue columns shows how many workers there are. It's a lot of information, uh, but you know, the real takeaway here is that it, it's hard to find a place to, uh, to live in Freeport if you're on a prevalent wage that's available in town. So, the Housing Committee, and I invite any other member of the Housing Committee to jump in at any time, uh, you know, really looking at that data, understanding where we're at from a, 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 an availability standpoint, we really looked at a couple of key focus areas. One, how do we increase the supply? And then put a welcome, out, welcome mat out. So we're, you know, we're welcoming developers to town, welcoming house, housing production in town. And then two, how do we lower costs? Um, that's an important one too. And to start out, we looked at um, the city of Portland had you know, a housing committee that had 240 recommendations. And one of our first exercises was to cull through that and prioritize. And a lot of options were available there. Incentives, um, density bonuses, inclusionary zoning, you know, making it a requirement that if you do a development that a portion of those units um, are at below market rate. Uh, and we really landed on the idea of leading with carrots um, over sticks. Perhaps in the future, as production ramps up, there'll be an opportunity to, to start some put a, uh, additional requirements for, through inclusionary zoning. But really to lead off, um, we felt like it was important to get some shovels in the ground and think about how we can increase supply. So the thought process here and the recommendations that we're about to share are really oriented towards that. How do we increase supply? I saw Ed's hand come up. focused on any particular income group? All of the above, really. I mean, ultimately, if you're, when you wade, wade into these issues, it becomes an affordability question. Um, yeah, so we listened. I, Mine isn't? No, well, you gotta hold it close. I will hold it closer. <laughs> so, as we listen to your recommendations, we should be thinking these are to develop housing units for people who are in the range of people who are earning a living in this town now, but can't find housing anywhere. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't make any claims to that. I think it's a key priority. I think it ultimately that's where so, the ultimate need is. 
you know, the market's going to support some housing outside of town, but if we want to look at the downtown vision, as Mitch mentioned, as a big priority, walkability impacts affordability, walkability impacts downtown vitality. Uh, so we, we married those together. I think that's a fair articulation, but if I got that wrong, I'd invite, you know, invite the housing. Well, I was just going to point out one of the statistics that John, I think John, you brought to the table early on was the range of age groups that live in Freeport as opposed to the range of age groups that live in the rest of Cumberland County. And there was an absence of 20, 20 to 35 year olds in Freeport. And so that in some ways might describe that income group, but it also describes a housing type that's missing in Freeport. And I think we thought a lot about, you know, how do we expand one of, I think one of the, uh, the principles that was in the back was we want a diverse community that has diverse people that, of, of all age groups and types. That doesn't mean we're just focused on how do you give a $12 an hour worker a house, and incidentally, most of them live in groups, and so the numbers get better. They actually do find places to live. And, uh, you, you know, I just, I, I own a, a par apartment uh, building in uh, Portland and rented an apartment today to two, $3,000 a month earners at 1800 bucks. And we sort of had it, you know, it's like right at the edge of where they can afford, but that's how they did it was two living together. So um, anyway, I think the point was a diverse, uh, d filling in supply gaps. And we focused a lot on the number one uh, uh, tool is more supply. When, you, when prices are going up astronomically and when there's no place available of a certain type, it describes a missing supply. Yep, all the above, I think is a, so we looked at, um, you know, making standards predictable and objective, we can go to the next slide, uh, process review improvements. And, you know, this is a, potentially a controversial one. Um, I know this, this, this recommendation to suspend the design review ordinance for multifamily. Uh, people care a lot about the built environment in Freeport and what it looks like. Uh, the, the housing committee really looked at our purview as how do we support housing production and increasing supply. And if you look at housing through that lens in Freeport, the design review is a, is a challenge. Uh, it's subjective at this point. Uh, the, it's been identified as a, as a priority. I'm not seeing anything new. Uh, this is all what we know. There's been money allocated to update the design review ordinance. Um, so this would be looked at as a short-term fix until that longer-term work could take shape uh, to pre increase predictability for everybody in the room, from residents to boards to applicants, uh, to lead to better outcomes. So a short-term fix on that front. Um, and then while the planning board works on longer term solutions. So that's one recommendation for the right. short term. Before you leave that, can you just do a little quick primer on what the design review ordinance is and how it relates to the other stuff that we have in town, zoning and things like that? Sure. Um, it, there's three, you know, site plan, uh, subdivision, and then design review. And uh, design review is, uh, you can see the geography there. It's a pretty substantial amount of of real estate. Uh, it includes the downtown. It stretches down Route 1 South. Uh, in terms of you know, increasing walkability and, and all of those priorities, that geography is central uh, to those outcomes and those opportunities. And what the design review does, and I'm surrounded by a bunch of experts, so I'll do my best here. Hopefully I pass the quiz. Um, it, it, it layers in additional uh, requirements around building scale and appearance and articulation and how it fits in uh, with the rest of the built environment. Uh, it's an important thing. You know, I think a lot of people care a lot about that for good reason. Uh, but the way it currently is written, there's concerns that it's pretty subjective. And that two reasonable people who care a lot about Freeport could look at the same project through the lens of the design review ordinance and come to completely different opinions about whether or not a project fits. Uh, so it's uh, another layer on top of uh, whether or not the building's the right size, whether or not it's the right orientation to the street, 
Um, and it really is designed to protect uh, the appearance of the built environment in that area, uh, which is great, uh, but currently it's, you know, it's a little subjective and there's opportunities to improve it. Is that helpful? Yeah. Great. Is this on? Yes, it is. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the terminology you're using for uh, what you're saying, short-term emergency repair of the ordinance. Because I, I'm obviously I'm on the board that handles this, and I, I've also read through um, some of your other documents, and you're talking about to get through this process of, of reviewing, figuring out, and changing the ordinance, you're anticipating up to 18 months, possibly two years of a time to make these ordinances get uh, brought forward, approved, and you know into the regulations. So my question has to do with your short-term emergency. Based on those numbers, it's possible that you could be requesting removing any review under design review for a two-year period, which might mean that anyone that comes in to put development in might have a two-year time frame, hypothetically, to come in and put in um, their applications and who knows how many, who knows what they would do. So I'm, my question is short term and for an emergency. That to me might, might be work on, uh, you know, make something that says within three months we need to have suggestions and start the process rather than waiting the way it's normally happening at the moment. That's a fair point. Three months would be great. It would be great, and I think if there's really a concerted effort, and this is put into the forefront of what needs to get done, I'm not sure why that should be a problem. If they have enough people and enough time to get the meetings done, you know, which is a problem, but it shouldn't be in this case. Uh, I don't know, Sam, do you want to, I don't know if you want to comment. Uh, I've got my planning board hat on now and just understanding two things that I wanted to share. One is that the design ordinance as it's currently written is remarkably subjective. And so we have identified early on that it's a ordinance that should be repaired and the repair is involves an RFP, a public uh, process to contract and then a series of steps of public hearings all along the way to make sure that the new format is, you know, has consensus. I think we're, at least on that now, with the housing committee hat on, uh, we are fairly convinced that that new design ordinance should be form-based. That is, it should be quite prescriptive about what we do or don't want in terms of size, scope, material. And by doing that, you remove the subjective nature because right now the design ordinance hangs on the words is compatible. And those, that's a, a, some, a window you can drive a truck through. I'll just say one other thing. Uh, yes, I believe it is a, 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 the, the ask for the repair, the emergency repair is for the length of that time. I do believe there probably are ways to accelerate that time and I would be certainly in favor of everything we could do to accelerate the time. But the m question I think everybody should be thinking about is what is the risk? And what could happen in that time? Let's say it was two years and now you're saying, well, gee, for a two year period, developers could come in and could do what? And I think that's what's important for us to think about and say, because we, we have, I think we have two choices. Uh, so first of all, on the what could they do? We have a uh, uh, zoning ordinances in place that are quite prescriptive about the size and location and distance and siting of the buildings. So all of those ordinances would remain in place. The, the look and feel is the potential danger and the um, housing by its unique nature of being a product that you have to put on the market generally uh, is it's pretty hard to imagine somebody building something that would be objectionable and have any hope to have renters. So that strikes me now, 
argue that, but I think it's worth arguing. Um, but it, yeah, yeah, it's a great, good point, Mitch, and it's a point for further conversation. You know, we, we shared this recommendation, I think, to Mitch's point, recognizing that it was going to spur a conversation. And oh, I wanted to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just one other point. I knew I had to, and the other, and if we don't, if we don't, I think it's safe to say that there will be zero development in Freeport until it's done. So, certainly zero market rate development in Freeport until it's done. Because I don't think it's possible that any developer would go into Freeport today knowing what they know about how that ordinance can be used. Thanks, Mitch. Um, good point. And just in the interest of time and to getting to discussion so that we can hear uh, from everybody, we're going to move through the rest of these recommendations pretty quickly. Um, you know, to Mitch's point, the next one really is long term to adopt a more prescriptive style of ordinance uh, where a developer could come in and understand what the project review board is likely to approve and work within that groove versus a, a more subjective ordinance. Um, there's some capacity to do that. It's a proven model. Auburn's been successful with it. Other communities have been successful with it. Um, so that is a long-term uh, recommendation as to a more prescriptive form-based code. Uh, the next one, uh, once you've got a more prescriptive code that's easier to interpret against an ordinance, uh, the next layer that falls into place is to delegate uh, more responsibility to the staff to be able to compare what the project is relative to the standard and then uh, be able to give it a thumbs up or thumbs down or uh, put it in front of the board. But with more objectivity, uh, it becomes easier to discern whether a project fits and we can save process time, volunteer time by delegating more of that to the staff once we all agree on what those objective standards could be. Uh, the next one has to do with uh, another long-term play and it came up in various conversations around town um, that boards were, were, you know, their hands were tied to look at projects with the existing ordinance, uh, even though a lot of work had gone in and community support seemed to be really in favor of the downtown vision. Uh, so taking that next step to, to make the, um, the ordinances consistent with the aspirations of the community. And to do that would be to uh, update the ordinances consistent with the downtown vision. Funding is another big one. Um, infrastructure, all of the above needs uh, resources. And so one thing that we've looked at is a transit-oriented development uh, tax increment financing district uh, that would uh, create a district within a quarter mile of the bus stations and the train stations in town. So to orient you, uh, the bright red blotch on the left, that's Maine Beer Company. And then you can see downtown, um, the bright red blotch, that's the flagship store of L.L. Bean. Uh, you can see they're small, but the numbers on those parcels uh, represent the acreage. And there's a fair amount of land uh, that has the opportunity with the right pedestrian upgrades, with the right sewer and water connections, uh, they could support a lot of infill development in the right spots. Uh, that would really focus on density, walkability, uh, and vitality downtown. Uh, whether it's a TIF district or whether it's just a, uh, a strategy around development, transit-oriented is, is a catchword now that can build momentum and capture resources from out of the town uh, to move the town forward on its goals. So happy to talk about that. There's work underway right now. Uh, Woodard and Curran, FEDC has contracted with Woodard and Curran a reputable firm out of Portland to do a infrastructure analysis for this geography. What kind of water, sewer, um, bike ped, uh, town catch, catchment basin, storm water, what's there now? Uh, what's going to need to be upgraded in the near future? And then beyond that, what type of investment would be required uh, to facilitate some development there? So within a month or two, uh, we'll have from Woodard and Kern a nice map that lays out where the stuff is that they can share publicly, and then also an itemized list of expenses to upgrade the infrastructure there to support some of the goals that we're working on. This is all for us to look at together and, and figure out what makes sense. Uh, the other piece of work that's uh, go ongoing right now, about to kick off, won't take that long, 
Uh, Bernstein Schur is going to do a tax shift analysis for a conceptual TIF district so that we as a community could look at some assumptions around development, what kind of new valuation that would generate, and then what are some different uh, tax increment financing scenarios that could shelter some of those revenues for the priorities that the community wants. So again, another data point that we can look at together and see what makes sense based on the numbers and based on our goals. And then the last one really is uh, around more of this, ongoing conversations, ongoing education, ongoing training. You know, you spend a lot of time with the experts that are on the housing committee who do this day in and day out, uh, really experienced folks, and there's always more to learn. This is a really complex topic um, for people who are professionals, let alone you know, the average person who comes in and, and watches a project be deliberated in front of a board. A lot of moving parts here. So let's continue to have these conversations and learn together and, and move forward together. And that's really our, our recommendations. And you know, this is designed to gather feedback. We offer these with you know, humility. Uh, we recognize that there's a lot of work that's ongoing in other boards and other communities. Um, we wanna be helpful in that regard and through the lens of housing, really housing, this is where we landed. So thanks a lot for listening. And I think you know, what we'd like to do is hear from the members of the boards and committees and councils well, we first. One more slide first. <clears throat> um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we we changed the order on this, so we threw Brett for a loop. But we have Sam Capala, who's the chair of the planning board, to talk about what else is going on beyond the five recommendations that came out of the housing committee. We're already doing some work on uh, updating zoning and housing and things like that. So Sam's going to tell us what's going on. Yeah, so first, sorry that uh, I was a few minutes late. I can blame it on simultaneous meltdowns from two children mm -hmm. um, at 5.50. So um, yes, like Brett said, and, and thanks to Brett and to the Housing Committee for all of their work putting these recommendations together. Um, but like Brett said, the Planning Board is working on these and other substantial projects right now. The first is LD 2003, which is a state law that I'm sure most or all of you are aware of in some, at some level which is specifically designed to address housing shortages in uh, statewide, really, and we are in a relatively good position in Freeport to deal with the state law and the compliance, but it is still a fairly heavy lift, I think, for uh, just the, the amount of cleanup that needs to happen across the zoning ordinances. It touches a lot of, a lot of parts of our extensive um, zoning documents already. So um, the, the goal is to remove unnecessary regulatory barriers to try to increase production. It includes standards for accessory dwelling units, which we already have standards for accessory dwelling units in Freeport, which are, I think, in most cases, as permissive as the state law indicates they should be. We have also talked uh, at the board level about making some of those standards even more permissive than they are currently, and we are continuing to be open to, to public input on that process. Um, there is an affordable housing density bonus in growth areas, which we'll talk about more in a second, allowances, and allowances for additional dwelling units on, on some properties, and that is a little bit complicated. We did have a public workshop a couple of weeks ago to talk through some of that. It really is parcel dependent and will be uh, complex to, to try to figure out for any given parcel how, what it would look like, but there will be opportunities for most, most parcels to have additional dwelling units in some capacity. Um, like I said, it requires changes to a lot of ordinances. It, the, the implementation deadline to get pushed back, and it is currently January 1st of 2024. So we have, what is that, five, four or five months to, to implement that. Um, so we will be working on that, obviously, over the next few months. The next is the comprehensive plan update, which is the RFP has been released, and I believe proposals were due today, actually. Is that true, or tomorrow? Yeah. Tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow. Uh, proposals are due tomorrow, so we will be evaluating those proposals very shortly and, and kicking that process off. The planning board will be the, the committee leading that project over the next 18 to 24 months, and it, there will be plenty of opportunities for public input as we work through that process. Of course, one of the things that we will do as part of the comprehensive plan update is identify the growth areas and evaluate the growth areas that we currently have downtown. I mean, uh, town, throughout the town. Downtown is, of course, one of those one of those areas. Um, but that will factor 
that will affect how the LD2003 implementation plays out because those growth areas will impact the, the parts of town in which additional housing bonuses will be available. Um, we also have in the other category on the far right, we have some other projects that are have already had funding secured, which include the, the big one, I think, is the design review ordinance update. Mitch talked a little bit about that. Um, it, it, we've been talking about this for quite a long time. We have had the money for a little while now. I think uh, it came, came available, what, a few weeks ago, I guess, as part of the, the fiscal year. But we have, um, we have started the RFP process. It has not been released yet for a variety of reasons. I think there's a lot going on. Town staff has a lot to do, and we are working as hard as we can, I think, to get that RFP out and get that process moving. We understand that it really can't go fast enough, um, but it is one of many projects that has staff, you know, tied up staff resources. So um, we are hiring consultants for that, of course, but again, Lots of, uh, lots of chances for, for public input as part of that process. The <clears throat> there will also be an outside review of the permitting process taking place uh, over the next, hopefully in that same time period. And the planning board is continuing to clean up the ordinances and, and look at ways to streamline the permitting process. We have changed, a, made some minor tweaks already to take some, some <laughs> put some projects at the staff review level so that they don't have to go through quite so many public hearings and through that process. So the planning board is, is very interested in, in expediting this process. And I think speaking broadly for the board, there's a lot of interest in, in promoting um, housing development in Freeport. And we, I think, or I at least, thank the, the housing committee uh, for, for its work. So I think the, uh, you know, just to, to build a little bit on what Mitch said in response to, I think, Linda's <coughs> comment uh, about the, the timeline, I think the proposal to, what, what's the word, to, to uh, suspend. suspend, sure, yes, to suspend the design review ordinance um, for the downtown district. We, one thing that the planning board talked very briefly about um, is, Looking at, looking at ways where that, that recommendation might be massaged a little bit so that it's not a full-on suspension or the suspension applies only in certain areas. There may be ways to massage that recommendation so that it's not an all or nothing recommendation. And I think you know, perhaps the council would be open to something like that. So I, I, I think, for, speaking for me personally, that's something I'm interested in exploring. I, I think they're, you know, in a perfect world, we would get this process done in three months. Uh, in a perfect world, we would have had it done three months ago. Um, but I think given the, you know, the constraints that we're working under, I think there may be a way to, to both expedite the process and get a, you know, sort of a compromise approach that's palatable to as many people as possible and, and hopefully lift the, what I've heard referred to as the de facto moratorium on development downtown um, right now. So looking forward to those discussions. Thanks, Sam. Um, so, like I said, next up we'll have an opportunity for the boards and committees to offer opinions, thoughts. We don't often get a chance to meet together. The planning board and the project review board don't have joint meetings. We don't have joint meetings at the council with either of these groups. So it's a valuable opportunity for us, us to talk uh, amongst ourselves um, in public. Uh, when we do that, and the same goes for when we open to the public after, um, it's not a time to talk about specific projects for a variety of reasons, we should not be doing that. So this is not a time to say, hey, on 22 Main, it should have been this or it should have been that, or on Depot Street, it should have been this or that, um, but to talk in more generalities. Um, so with that, um, I, I don't think we need to go one at a time, but if anybody on the boards and committees wants to say something, if you want to raise your hand, and, uh, and we'll make sure you have a mic and see how that discussion goes. So Todd, kick us off. Um. My question is, the focus is, seems to be very clearly on the downtown districts. Um, has there been discussions about spreading this out across the entire town, looking at minimum lot sizes, um, subdivision, you know, and subdivision, for example, um, some of the requirements and examples underground utilities, which is a cost, which is a burden if you're a developer or a buyer. 
Um, I'm kind of curious what the uh, discussion's been, again, spreading out across the whole town. So yeah, I'll take a stab at that and welcome any, anybody else in the housing committee that wants to participate. A uh, couple of thoughts on that. Really, I think the idea was to focus initially on the downtown where there had been a lot of discussion and there was more fertile ground for, for common ground in the downtown with the idea that one, the comprehensive plan is coming down the pipe and that's important relative to lot size and density. Uh, and, and then two, doing it on the downtown would create a model and some muscle memory on how to do this that could then be applied uh, more, more fully and more broadly geographically. So this would be an initial step um, in the near term where there's more consensus, more common ground through a lot of conversation in the community. And then two, as a comprehensive plan takes shape, that model could be expanded out. Can, can I? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Can I take another, uh, just to, to add on, on what Brett said? I, I do see that work as ongoing for the planning board. And I think as part of the comprehensive plan process, going through all the districts over the next year to, I don't know, three, four, whatever it takes, you know, it, it is kind of always an ongoing process to, to evaluate the zoning in town and see what changes we can make. I think. To me, the focus on the downtown is to address a specific need and a specific vision that, that was identified in the downtown vision plan. There was a pretty robust public input process there, and you know the, the town, or the, the, the consultants rather, the principal group came out with, with a, a document that outlined the priorities that I think reflected well the, the town's um, desires, and building housing downtown was one of those. So I see this, you know, this as a, as a specific, this potential um, suspension or this potential emergency fix as a specific response to that desire that was outlined in, in, that, uh, um, in that document and also you know, the, the, the shortage of housing that we see, not just in our community, but other communities as well. So I, but I think that absolutely there's a need to evaluate the zoning and, and try to reduce the barriers to, um, to development throughout all the zoning districts. I, I just think this is a great place to start. I, I just gonna throw it back that I think the, the downtown vision project was flawed in that it was only focused on downtown. And, um, and I think it should have focused overall on Freeport. So. I know while we're waiting for a comprehensive you know, update, but um, you know, we're asking for emergency um, you know, action to be taken on, again, because of the, all the attention that's been recently focused on downtown. And I think this is a town-wide solution on an emergency basis. Could, that consideration should be given to that. Well, could I just make a couple comments? The, uh, the design ordinance only affects the downtown area. Right. And so that, that's part of the problem. And uh, just to echo what they, the, these guys said, the, the first task was to fulfill the, what are the barriers to implementing the vision plan? And that had to do with housing downtown and there's a design ordinance there that is a barrier of epic proportion. Uh, the other problem, I am with you. I think the answer to housing uh, broadly in Freeport is not only downtown. Um, almost the entire town does not permit anything denser than one acre zoning. And, you know, there's many housing types that are eight to the acre or 12 to the acre that could be built in locations that probably not always downtown. But the problem there is the comprehensive plan. You can't spot zone it, and we're about to do a comprehensive plan, and that's real, and it needs a lot of public input. And so that we sort of tabled it and said, start here, do that, do that. But yes. I, just to build on that too, if you look at that geography, that's not that different than that transit-oriented development concept. It's pretty similar. And if you're going to do that type of um, targeted, in thanks, Dan, targeted investment you'd want the land use poly policy to marry up with the infrastructure. So I, I, I see a lot of value in what Todd's uh, recommending. I wanted to say that I'm gratified that there's a lot of people that are interested in this in town besides those who are on the boards. And I think it might benefit 
the thinking process, if there was somewhat of an open call for people in town who do have some expertise maybe in, in regulation review, um, in, in just their thinking, who might be allowed to come together and have a few meetings also to look at the ordinances. I mean, I'm fully aware that the ordinance needs to be adjusted and it's convoluted and it's overly burdensome in cases, but um, I think people in town, besides bringing in an outside um, group from an RFP, I think you need to have a little broader input from people in town and maybe a few others from some of the boards that are involved. And I do thank the Housing Committee. I also um, thank the Social and Racial Equity Committee for their original work pushing this forward. And I think that's how we got here. And I think it's always helpful to have other in, you know, information brought in by individuals. Hi, I'm Fred Madeira on the Project Review Board. So one of the things that just strikes me is certainly we need more housing and all that, but looking more broadly at the ordinance itself, the purpose of the ordinance, my fear in making this an emergency repair is we get away from what I believe, at least in my opinion, is still important, which is a desire to uh, promote design which is compatible with the present character of Freeport and assure that changes to contemporary buildings and new construction do not distract from the adjacent historic buildings. It feels like there's a jumping off point, either we're one or we're the other. If we make this emergency degree take place, then the realization of the purpose of the awareness disappears. Chime in from the outside. So I'm Jim Monteleone, also on the project board. I'm sorry that I'm <coughs> outside the circle here, because I arrived a couple minutes late. <clears throat> um, I was hoping to, to initially express concern about you know, this, this temporary suspension. Um, I mean, I've, <clears throat> I've got concern about you know, future changes, which of course is a policy decision to be decided on another day. I don't think I, I didn't fully appreciate the extent to which um, the design review standards are very important to this community until some recent projects that brought out kind of hordes of people to communicate their, their perceptions about the importance of adhering to their interpretation of design review. It clearly is very important to people. Um, the notion of just setting it aside so we can pursue some other objective is, um, is concerning. And I think it sends the wrong message to the people in our community about what we prioritize. Now, with, with that, I, I'd like to understand a little bit more about what went into these recommendations. And if, if you don't mind, just, I've got a couple of questions. How did you calculate the cost that the design review process adds to a project when you're determining that removing it is going to make projects more affordable. Is that a direct, direct question? Yes, please. It's, it's, uh, again, anybody in the housing committee, it's, it's hard to answer that question without using a specific advance example. Um, and to Councillor Pilch's idea there about staying away from that. But if you think about every additional meeting with an architect, um, you know, site plan, um, arborist, time, it's, it's a fair amount of money there. Uh, and also there's the time. And I think, and again, I, you know, predictability is an important part of it as well. Um, Sam mentioned you know, a de facto moratorium. The reality is, is that developers are gonna have a hard time coming into Freeport right now uh, because they see an unpredictable process. And so, if we look at the housing data, we look at the supply. Um, to Mitch's point, we've got more data from our intern, but she's looked at census data. Freeport is an older community than most uh, communities in the state. And if you make it harder for young people to live in Freeport, that's only gonna be exasperated over time as that population chart skews further up the age bracket. So these are trade-offs. It, it, what you're saying is a fair point. And in, clearly, 
the design review ordinance is important to this community, but there are other things that are important too, and we have to be have to understand the trade-offs that we're that we're making and make informed decisions about what those trade-offs are. Um, so what we hear, and there's other people in this room I know who have heard it as well, is that there are projects right now that are not coming forward because there's concern about the process. So in, actually putting a dollar amount on it, um, it's hard to do that without getting into specifics, but it's it's a real thing. I, I glean from that that this is it's anecdotal. You've got an example of, it sounds like we're relying on some remarks from one project rather than the, the, the broader scope of projects. And um, I think that it's a stretch to say that, you know, a comprehensive suspension will fix a problem that we don't actually, that we can't enumerate what the cost of that problem is. If we can't summarize, okay, this is the difference between a developer, you know, this adds you know, X percentage onto the development costs, then we're just, we're just guessing. And the notion that we're gonna strip that away without any reason to believe, like any concrete data that it, it makes the project X percent cheaper, then it's likely not accomplishing its purpose. <clears throat> Another, one more, one other question I wanted to understand is that to what extent has this committee considered how many projects have been rejected for failing to meet design review by the project board in recent years? Do, are, are, are you, any of you aware how many projects have been rejected no, that's a fair point. I think, you know, um, one of our members who was on the Freeport Community Services Board uh, referenced a, a report from 2016 that showed that Freeport's housing supply, in terms of availability, was zero. There was very low inventory for folks to move into town um, or to stay in town if you're a young person who went to college and you want to come back. That's a difficult thing. Uh, if you're uh, an older person who's living on the outskirts of town, on a few acres and you want to downsize, but you want to stay close to your friends and family, there's very limited supply for you to be able to do that. So we're, we're been operating at a very low inventory for, for a long period of time. Um, and I, I, I've only been here for 18 months, so I don't know that data point. Um, but I do know that uh, there is a level of reluctance to come into town and develop a project right now. I think if you look around, the southern, I mean, the southern Maine, communities throughout southern Maine have that same low inventory. The perception is that you're, you're correlating that low inventory with the design review ordinance. And I think that's a false correlation. And I haven't seen anything in the presentation to, to actually verify that there's some legitimacy between that correlation. The issue that, that we're discussing here is if, if to what extent have you considered how many projects have been rejected? So I'm coming, I'm approaching two years on, on the board, and I'm not aware of a single project that the project board has rejected for failing to meet design review. Not one. Instead, the board works to c communicate you know, different ideas, encourage people to come back and you know, make changes, and we, we find ways to get people approved in a way that this kind of jury of members feels it reaches that standard. So the notion that developers can't get through this process is, is just detached from the actual process that we go through. Um, and I think that, that that's important to be considered as we talk about just stripping it away as this emergency mechanism, because frankly, I don't think it's going to change anything. We see development coming that's going to continue to, to, to come. And I don't think, you know, given how, how collaboratively we work with project developers, I don't think that's going to change. Do you want to respond to that? I'll just jump in on that. I'm, I'm Ford Reiki. I'm the chair of the Project Review Board. Um, I'm only up here because Dan made me come up here. I'm not speaking. <laughs> Somebody had a keep um, company. Um, I, uh, I want to put in context my, my context on what Jim said. But I first want to say, Lots of times in the project review board, we wish there were more 
community involvement. So we're at that point now, and I think it's healthy. And I'm, I'm personally delighted to see the level of fact-based work you're doing and the talent you brought to this. And I personally would love to see Freeport be a place that's welcoming to development. And, and we have the town hall in most respects that can do it. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a good place, uh, in my experience, to do business. Um, I, I am, we all have our own orientations. My particular passion is historic preservation. I worry about Main Street. Um, our Main Street is, is an awkward one to protect if you want to protect its feel. But, you know, it's not, it's not Bridgeton or um, even Yarmouth where you, you just, there are loads and loads of historic buildings. Freeport's been compromised and sometimes you wonder whether it's even worth trying to hang on to it. So if, if, if there is some sort of modification to, to design review, I hope that Sam's uh, direction takes hold that there'll be, there'll be some massaging of it to protect Main Street. There are some ugly buildings out there. Um, I'll pick on Falmouth. The two new tall buildings in Falmouth are dramatically at odds with the other buildings around them, in my opinion. Something like that coming in on Main Street could really change the balance of, of Main Street. So uh, design review is about compatibility. It is subjective. There are lots of things in government that are subjective. I don't think that's necessarily a bad label. Um, and in defense of the urgency of this, I've been on the board for five or six years. We, Project Review Board has never denied a project, not a subdivision, not design review certificate, not a site plan review. And of the, of the design review certificates that we've reviewed, we've only modified the appearance of one in our process, and that was this one that's been so controversial. So I don't, I understand word gets out, um, and this was one that had, had a lot of this public discussion about it, but the fact is we've not denied or, ref, or, or ref, um, not denied any projects in my whole experience of the board. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Ed, do you want to go next? Yeah, um, <clears throat> from a short-term council perspective, someone who's watched the downtown vision grow and uh, see tendrils seek out, uh, this seems to me to be uh, a key to the downtown. I don't think I think we wouldn't all be here if we didn't believe that housing downtown was a key to the experience that we hope to promote in the downtown. I think, uh, although Dan says don't, don't talk about a specific project, one that we all know has put the town at a juncture, which is critical. Um, it's between um, a, uh, a situation in, in, in which you do something as shocking, from my, my perspective as an attorney and a participant in public process, um, as the one that is here in front of us. It, it's a really extraordinary, um, suggestion that we would exclude residential construction from downtown review ordinance. I understand why. I mean, I, I get the motivation, and I think it's it's done its job. It's gotten us all here. Um, I'm here because of it. Um, but I don't. I think it's a false choice, at least initially, um, that there have been a lot of discussion here about timing, um, and that um, one way to solve this problem is to do this. The other way to do it is to expedite the process by which we do the things we need to do to send the message to the community of developers that we want them here. We mean downtown, vision means residential housing downtown. We're prepared to make the commitment as a community to do what's necessary to shorten that period of time to two, three, or six months as opposed to exclude this from development. And I think we have the guts of that through the downtown process. You know, whether you like it, where it it developed or you don't, um, and everybody's entitled to that view. I think Dan's done, a, and John have done a wonderful job of bringing public input into this. Um, and as a result of what Principal Group has done, we have the guts of the, of the repair to design review ordinance in front of us, and sure, there's some more comment, but we don't need to go out for months of public, in my view, public input to supplement a project that's been going on for three years and we've spent half a million dollars to get to. So what I would do if it were up to me, and it's not, and it will be less and less up to me as uh, November approaches, um, but I would say, let's not talk about repairing the design review ordinance by excluding new residential and mixed use. Let's, let's just go forward with the process that's in front of us to develop the repair that's necessary. It's on the table. 
we, we can get it done. I believe we have the kind of commitment that's in this room tonight. So please, that's my plea. Um, let's do that. And if that fails, and you know, in, in the three to six month period that we think we need in order to show the, the, the state of Maine and, the, and Cumberland County we are serious about residential development in the downtown, then bring this back. And, and then you'll have the kind of consensus. Yeah, we couldn't get it done because of everything else. So I, that's my approach, my plea, and it's the reason I'm here. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Uh, just to, again, I'm third time, I guess. To echo that, I would totally agree with, with all of that. And then I would also ask, too, that, that we approach this townwide, not downtown. Look at the townwide. If you change the minimum lot sizes, what happens? How many more opportunities become, become available? And if that means sh shifting it from FEDC with a downtown focus to the town planning staff, let's do it. You know, let's, let's make sure that, that it's getting done where it needs to get done and looking at the whole town. I see, I think, a couple of, di so I think that process will happen and has been kicked off as part of the comprehensive planning process. I think the, the difference between that and between this proposal is one of time. And there is a sense of urgency, I think, that the housing committee feels, and I think they're picking up on something that has been identified in the community more broadly too. So I, it's not that those things won't happen. I think it's, a, it's, it's just the timescales on which they're happening that really is the, the crux of this issue. You know, I think I'm on the record, I think many times saying that I think the design review district is a great thing for this town and has been, and I don't think getting rid of all subjectivity is ideal. I don't even think it's possible. Um, I would. I think we have to have some subjectivity in the design review ordinance. Um, I think that's what makes our downtown what it is today. I think that it is possible to believe that and also to see space for and some sort of temporary emergency, whatever you want to call it, change that might promote housing. I, I also think that the, sorry, I'm kind of getting all of these thoughts that I've built up here out all at once. But um, the, the other thing I think is um, that it, it, so it, it's possible to, to, to believe that. Sorry, I just totally de derailed my, <laughs> my train of thought. Um, I think we, yeah, I'll come. We'll, we'll come back, back to me. We'll yeah. come back to you, Lynn. Um, the design review ordinance is very finite in terms of telling us what we're allowed to consider. It's all boxed in. And yes, there's subjectivity within those, those various pieces. But then along came the new development process, downtown vision plan, with wonderful ideas. And while we're doing design review on a particular project, we're told specifically you can't consider this new information, this design, this uh, vision plan. So I see that as our, our biggest problem. Don't throw the baby out with the dishwater. I think design review ordinances have merit, as you just said, and there's a place for it. But if we could somehow incorporate the vision into this review ordinance so that we're working with, a, with realistic expectations of what the community wants, not in a vacuum, not out of a book, but we're taking in all of that wonderful information that came from the community at large in terms of how they'd like to see it develop. So why can't, I would love to see those, those two uh, pieces merge so that we can be effective in getting the housing you want, getting the look you want, and not dealing with them as two totally separate entities. I hate to keep coming back to the, the issue of time here, but I think that you know again that's that's really what we would love to do as part of the comprehensive uh, the uh, sorry the design review ordinance updates is merge the the vision and the and the zoning and that is something that I think we want to happen over the next eighteen months to you know two years I think it's really the community the decision the community needs to make is are we okay with wait and that and that's I'm not passing judgment on that like is are we okay with that waiting for those two years and if so. May I? Great. Yeah. I, I mean, I think Sam's right at the spot where we really have to make a decision. And you know, if it's two years, and has to be two years, 
you know, then the downtown vision is frustrated and a lot of its key uh, recommendations um, go by the board and all the money we spent and all the time and all the input we got is not lost, but it's, it's diluted. I can't understand to the, for the life of me why this town, knowing that this is the critical point for downtown visioning and, as was suggested, for protection of the downtown, which we all care about, the 150 people who showed up, Never mind that part, because I can't talk about it. But the, the point being, that if, we, if we really believe this, why we can't cut through the baloney and sit down at a table, Dan, you, 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 you can orchestrate this, John, you can make this happen, Mitch, you can make this happen, and we sit down, instead of having public input, we put together the things Principal Group has given us for objective standards for the downtown to repair it, and some other things that we may need to talk about to protect it and get it done and give ourselves like the sewer committee did uh, two months to get that done. If you don't get it done, you, you, you failed. And you come back and you admit it because it was just too hard to do. But right now, what we're saying is, oh, it's going to take us 18 months to two years. And in that period of time, how many opportunities are we going to have lost? I think the message we need to send as a community is we are going to make a all-out World War III, whatever it is, campaign to get this done. Everything we're doing, all the money you got, all the money we got in our pot, we get it done. And we come to, with Brett's help and everybody's help, Caroline's help, get the, get the repair done in the next two or three months and then tell the development community, here are your objective standards and if you meet them, you get approved. Okay. Can I just ask a question, really, of, of, of Caroline and of Sam? Because we, were, we have been operating under the assumption that it is impossible to repair the design ordinance in less than 18 months. And we've thought a lot about it. I don't know, Vanessa, if you want to, what? I don't know if you want to comment as well, but I mean, that is the issue. If it could be fixed in four months, I think every single person here would be down. I just don't know how to do it. Excuse me, if you go through the procedures that are set now, you do, but instead of having a moratorium, you have a declaration from the town council saying we have a uh, housing opportunity in this town that requires us to take extraordinary, and we're going to suspend, not the uh, emergency repair design review ordinance to exclude new residents, we're going to suspend the procedural operation for public input and all of those things, and we're going to have a rush to determination. And, and let somebody who doesn't want that to happen challenge us wherever we want because we're going to get challenged wherever, whatever we do anyway. I'm just, I, I'm completely in favor of doing something like that personally. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how extreme you can get because public input is important. But um, this has been discussed at the, at the project review board level many times. You've got the downtown visioning and we've got ordinances that don't match the vision. And I was thinking about the last time we had a workshop on that at Project Review Board of the seven of us, six of them have come and gone on the board. I'm the only person on the Project Review Board who was around when we had that workshop. So it's, I'm not pointing fingers. It's taken way too long for this to become a priority that's aligned with the, with the downtown vision. Um, I think there's legitimate staff pressure. And I don't want to, I mean, there's legitimate staff pressure. And I, I don't know, I've been, Frustrated that the design ordinance hasn't been out the door for eight months and been pretty verbal about it And it, it, it eight months to get it out the door. So it's not even out the door yet it, it, We can't get it started. I don't, I don't know what it would take. I, the question is can we hire a, not, another planner? It's gonna take something like that I think it really depends how much community input you want if We're told that we're just gonna go forward and not have a long public hearing process, then I think that shortens it quite a bit right there. If we could follow the vision plan that already built consensus. Uh, I'll kind of weigh in with my individual thoughts, um, a version of which I, I offered up at a council meeting to a mostly empty room, so I'll say it again with more people in the room. Um, but Freeport, especially Freeport's downtown, our main street and surrounding streets, is unique. Um, there may be one, maybe two other places in Maine that draw more people than our Main Street. So I think it's important for us all on the boards as the public to be stewards of that and be responsible stewards of that and not to throw up our arms and say anything goes because we need more housing. 
Um, so I'm, I'm not supportive of that first recommendation. Um, I think we need to do it carefully, but I don't think we need to spend a ton of time doing it. I think what's in front of us is not an easy thing to do because I don't think you can take a page out of our 137 page downtown vision report and say, let's just copy this into the design review and call it done because the vision was very intentionally a vision and it was explained to me as, as watercolor postcards but not specific work plans, right? We're kind of trying to make that transition now. But taking that watercolor vision of the direction we want to head um, and turning it into a design review ordinance is very difficult work. And it's not something that we're going to get everybody in the room or everybody in town to agree on, but we need to build some kind of consensus. So one of the things that I, I'm really curious about from the people here and the public and who aren't here, um, the, uh, one of the recommendations is the form-based code, right, which is sort of a pattern book. And if you're going to build something like this, then you're fast-tracked. So on the one hand, great, right? We know what we want. If you want to build something like what we said we want, then go for it. I'm also a little concerned that we start to build things that look like other things, and it reduces the amount of creative architecture and artistic expression we have in our built environment. Um, and the only way to regulate that is going to be with some subjectivity, right? There's no way to say, build something like we have, or if it's pretty. Right, without being subjective. So, you know, I don't want to take the lowest common denominator. Um, people always say design by committee tends to be very vanilla. So I think we need to be careful of that. that. That's my concern about form-based code, but I'm curious to hear what the boards think and, and what the public thinks. Um, and I do want to get to public input as well, because it's, it's um, 20 after 7, so I want to um, I, I'd just like to add that I, I <clears throat> find working collaboratively with my fellow board members is, it's a very, um, gratifying process. The frequent mentions of, we'll just turn it over to the staff, I think has inherent problems. One, you'd, you've only got Caroline. <laughs> you know? and it, the staff is not, not huge, and they've already got a huge workload. I, I think the purpose of these boards is to be representative. And so you've got your representatives in place on the boards, and we wrestle with these decisions trying to come to uh, the right answer. But um, I personally feel saying, well, we'll just let staff handle design review issues and check the box is, I think Freeport will lose a lot in, by virtue of not being able to hear their, quote, elected representatives talk it through and have an understanding of the rationales when they do. I, I just want to make one quick, I, I won't talk on and on like I usually do. I want to make one quick suggestion. If you took this uh, number one recommendation, take off the definition that you have after short term, just remove that and say, make an emergency repair to the design review ordinance, period. And let first the design, uh, the pro uh, project review board have a, either an extra meeting or an extra hour or two at our next meeting and let us sit there. We're the ones that have been using this ordinance. Let us sit together in, initially and say, where would we cross this out, change this, merge this, and let us get some input to whoever the, the people are that's gonna do the final, maybe that's the planning board, I'm not sure. But give us a chance to do and look at what we've been working with first. I think real quickly, just on behalf of the Housing Committee, I, I think this is a, a great outcome from where we started from and what we offered tonight. Great ideas, um, finding middle ground, moving forward expeditiously, but sort of at the speed of trust where everybody knows where we're going and how we're working together. Um, for me, I'm looking around the room at our committee, I, this is a great discussion. and. Uh, we appreciate the open mind uh, everybody's brought to this. It's a little tricky to almost, you know, I feel like you're critiquing the hard work of volunteer boards. That's not easy to do. Um, but the outcome, I think, has been great. So all these ideas around moving forward together is the right place to be. Thanks a lot. I'm just... Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't talk with my back to... The John, I'm going after you, by the way. Okay. So... I'm, I'm listening, and that, that's precisely as Dan and, and Sam have said why, uh, actually, and Ford, you said it too, like we, we kind of beg for these full rooms when we hear 
from different people, and, and we're gonna hear from the public here shortly, but just getting the boards around has been uh, very informative, and um, I think that's an interesting point, that the Project Review Board has not declined a project based on design review criteria in your recollection, or maybe, maybe you sent one back, or whatever the very small sample was. So part of the context of the language that you see here is this result, this room full of people, and so is it possible that we could take all of this momentum, uh, at least amongst the board members here, and set a goal following Councillor Bradley's uh, example by January, before we get wrapped up in budgets, can we have a draft rewrite of the design criteria as the Project Review Board, who is the most facile with that document, lays out so that we could have at least a template to then take back to the public to address what Linda just said, which is we're making an emergency repair. Is it possible for us to do that by January? I think it is, and it's probably gonna require everybody pulling the rope, but I'm actually really pleased that from what I can tell, we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. And indeed, um, the, the gravity of a suspension for two months brought a reaction. This is the reaction we were hoping to get, which is a lot of public input. So let's get focused on our commitment to our community and, and make something happen in, in four or five months. I think even if, even if we do fail, we're, we, we will accomplish something, which is that we can at least identify what we can't agree on, and we can work on that through a slightly longer process. So I'd, I'd welcome that, and I'd certainly be willing to participate and convene and host or whatever, bring pizza, get people to come to meetings. That pizza pad will work. <laughs> May I speak quickly? Um, when We do. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say one last thing before I give it to the public on this notion of, I think the idea of, of the housing committee, town council, planning board, and project view board working together would, in my opinion, be the most expedient way to get there. And I'm not sure everyone understands how little interaction there is between the project review board. We, we hope to get before the council once per year doesn't always happen. We meet only once a year, and we've never met with the housing committee. So I think on that, with that type of, of, of objective together, I, I think you could be productive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Vanessa, did you want to say something before we open to the public? Uh, I did, but it, I mean, first, it's really rare that I actually get to say things in my own town as a resident, but also in the planning realm and spectrum. Um, so. I think I just wanted to point out to Councillor Bradley's point that you know when we did the downtown vision plan, we were really purposeful about the the activities that we did with the community, myself included, um, and we approached that work to get code ready. So unless the spirit of that work has changed, which I don't think it has, you know we're ready to go. We could sit down, put heads together, and come out with something for the community to respond to because we've done the legwork already. So that's just the comment I wanted to add. That's useful. All right, Andy, do you wanna say something? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello? Hello? Yeah, no. uh, I'm on the Andrew Arsenal planning board and public, I guess, back here. Uh, one of the things is I sit back here and listen to the conversation I spent many years, Kenny too, we go into a lot of planning board meetings over the years, last 20, 30 years, and watched the development downtown from the back of the room. And uh, what I hear tonight is one thing left out, and that's the applicant. Um, you know, I remember reading a case in Yarmouth years ago with Gordy Wakeland versus the town of Yarmouth. They went to the law court. It was about subjectivity. Uh, they told him he couldn't put apartments in his house because the density of development and the intensity of use was too much. Law court came back and said basically the applicant has to be able to read the ordinance and understand what he has to do to pass or fail. 
to me, that seems subjective uh, was taken out of that by, by doing that. And I think we have too much subjectivity in these ordinances. Uh, I know it's fun to have everybody sit around and say, you know, this is my vision of Freeport and that's that, my vision of Freeport. But without a developer, without applicants coming forward and laying $100,000, $300,000 on the line and putting their neck on the table waiting for the block to fall, uh, we don't have development. And that's the key component I didn't hear to hear tonight was, what's the applicant's position? What's he think about these ordinances? We think they're all cozy. We think it's saving Freeport. Most of Freeport was developed long before there was ever a zoning ordinance. So we're trying to recreate something that didn't happen. We're trying to make something happen that had no ordinance to develop it. And uh, I think it's nice to sit around and think all these things up, but until we get down to the fact, what do we really want and what are we willing to do to get it? And we have to have an applicant for that. We have to have a developer that's willing to throw his money at it now, 8%, 7 or 8%, maybe 10% by the come next year. Who's going to come to Freeport and wing it uh, when somebody says, the building's too tall? I don't like it. Uh, I don't like those windows. Where's his voice? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to stand up and say tonight. Where's his voice? So that's my statement. Thank you. Um, so it's probably a good time to open up to the public. There are two wireless microphones. So if you want to say something, raise your hand, wait for somebody to bring your microphone, and then speak, but try and keep your comments on the shorter side since we don't want to be Thank here. you very much for having this meeting tonight. Bob Stevens, um, I like the idea that's been proposed that I've seen develop here, which is rather than take an action to get rid of something that deals with what we th think is important, design, and then go about trying to deal with a substitute, inertia can set in. Uh, we, could, we could instead not throw out what we have here, but decide what has been suggested, which is move as quickly as we can to get what we want. And if that is happening, let the word go out that that's what we're doing, and we're going to make sure that it'll work for people coming to develop in Freeport. Anybody else? Uh, hello, Joanna Benoit here. Um, my husband and I actually are of the 20 to 35 range that we're talking about. Barely, but we are. Um, and I mean, we feel super fortunate to live here. We love our house. It's a tiny little ranch on Route 1. We want to stay here, but we will grow out of that house eventually. So we'll need somewhere to grow into. And, you know, I hear from my peers and colleagues here in Freeport that folks want to keep the de design review ordinance as it is. Echoing folks, what we've been hearing here as sort of do what we want, do it as fast as possible to get on the same page for how do we keep the design review ordinance, but how do we keep it in a way that makes sense and is more um, accessible. Um, so all that to say that I, I kind of am happy to hear this is the consensus. We also have folks who are in temporary housing in Freeport right now who would love to stay. Um, so when it comes to these complex, very dynamic issues, 18 to 24 months isn't super long to do the right thing, but it sounds like what we're building here is consensus to do it faster. So just wanted to echo my support there. Thanks, Joanna. Um, there's also a bunch of people on Zoom. I think we've got 10 or 12 people. So if anybody out there in Zoom land wants to speak, raise your virtual hand and Caroline will try and call on you. We'll see if we can make that work as well. Anybody else in the room who wants to speak? Just briefly, I, I thought the discussion tonight was great. And I just want to express my appreciation for all the volunteer work that the counselors do, the planning board does, the design review board does. I just appreciate it, all the work you do to make Freeport a good place to live. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff. I, I think where we are right now, we have the concept. Yeah. We just don't know what it looks like, and I think that's where we're having the issue. And if we all get on the same side, then I think it will be a lot better. Also, I'd like to know, what, Caroline, what do you think about what we are talking about here? How much more work is that going to put on you? Do you have enough people in your? Oh, to have a 
group look at some emergency repairs while we're working on the larger project. Um, my advice would be to bring a small working group back. That's what we did before when we looked at some minor changes years ago. We had a couple members from the planning board, project review board. Um, council wasn't interested then, but I think I can get some volunteers now. Um, you know, we had a small working group with two members from each board. We could include the housing committee, and they met every couple of weeks until the world shut down. Um, but by doing that, you know, we met during the daytime. We didn't have big boards and committees, so anybody could come, but we didn't have all the same hearing requirements. So you had to do homework, but you could dive right in and get discussion going, kind of like the sewer group did. Small group committed to the issue, meeting pretty regularly. Is there help that you need? We're going to need volunteers. That can come and not. The biggest challenge before was getting volunteers. I mean, m many people in this room volunteer on a board. They work full-time jobs, and now we're going to ask them. So if the council decides this is the route that they want to take, getting volunteers that can make a commitment to come every week because people missing meetings, when you have a small working group, it, it does slope block it down. Uh, just to go one step further, you are strapped right now. The planning department is strapped. Going one step further, does it would a contract part-time person who reports to you specifically for this assist you under your direction? That's what um, we, we I, need I, to be specific to get this going. Yeah, I think it warrants a follow-up conversation from the council with Good. how they want to move Thank forward. You. Yeah. yeah. One, one comment on that, and then Jay, I, I see you in the back. Um, about four months or so ago. Caroline was one of the busiest town planners around and had a ton of respect and uh, admiration from people in town hall and developers and everybody who, who interacted with her. Um, and then our town manager left and we said, Caroline, you're not busy enough. So we gave her another full-time job on top of her already existing full-time job, uh, which speaks to if you want to get something done, you give it to the busiest person. So we're asking a lot of her. We hope that we'll have a new town manager in place before November. Um, and that should help a little bit, but I don't want to discard your idea. I think that, that it does merit a follow-up discussion, because even when we alleviate that part of Caroline's world, there's still a lot that this is going to entail, so uh, I support that. Um, Jay. Yeah. I'll defer to beauty. Is that, are you talking to Ed? Of course. <laughs> uh, he's pointing back at you. Okay. Um, I had a lot of things to say, and I was intended to stand up. Uh, my name is Jay Yomaz. I live in town with my wife, Jen. We've been doing business in town for about 30 years, and um, we were pretty active in this last um, project uh, review with the 22 Main Street project. Uh, I know it brought out some some uh, deep feelings on both sides, and uh, you know we're we're passionate about the town and 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 the way it looks and the process and keeping it as as I don't know, pure, let's say, as possible. But um, again, I was, I was incented to stand up uh, when Caroline was talking about being kind of busy and then Todd, um, and, and she was talking about volunteers and people having to help out in the process, and then Todd said, uh, you know, why don't we get somebody to help you out? And, you know, I wonder what some of the best consultants in this country or the world would say to us as a group. And I'll bet you they would say, why don't you hire somebody or a whole bunch of people, okay? And if money's an object, work on that as well. But I've said to Caroline, and, and I hope you can you know, recall that I said this you know, to Caroline, get more help for Nick, get more help for Caroline. It's, it's really important. Um, it it kind of reminds me of this, uh, you know, seeing these guys struggle reminds me of that bumper sticker that said it'll be a great day when the Air Force can have a bake sale and the school department will be fully funded. And, and, and it's, it, it's, it's too bad when we have to see these guys struggle and, and, and we all know that the volunteers are stretched thin and, and, and then it creates some animosity when, when, when things don't get put through correctly or the way some people feel like they should be and the, the, um, you know, the boards have really put their, their necks out to do a, to, 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 to do a good job. Um, I did want to sort of back up and echo Jim's commentary, um, and it was followed up by Ford and a couple of other people that, you know, there was some, uh, we, we, we shouldn't be so reactive, and we should 
we should follow a really logical path. And one of the things I heard from some people whose opinion I really respect was that there was, there haven't been many projects that have been turned away or shot down in most people's recent memory. And during this last appeal, I quoted Ford Reiki and him saying that, you know, on, on this project uh, that was recently contested, that he had never seen in his, in his tenure even close to the amount of, of concern or pushback. And, and that sent a very, very big message. And, uh, and then it's been backed up tonight here by people confirming that we haven't had uh, any projects ex that were turned down, is that correct? Or, or, or you know, it, it, so we have a decent process that may need to be tweaked, but this idea of, of throwing out the, the, um, the ordinance um, for a short-term measure to incent development, uh, I think is also a false, uh, a false premise or a fallacy. And I could tell you that the, the consultants that the top governments and people on the planet would tell you is that it's not a, a money-making game right now. If interest rates were 3%, you could probably double the barriers. And, and with interest rates at 3%, with apartment rents at what they are or could be higher, you could almost double the barriers and people be lining up to get into town. I could, I could promise you that. And, and I'd like to hear from the top professionals in the state or the region that could, could or couldn't confirm that. One of the best developers around, um, um, Hillary Rocket, has his project on hold. Uh, and I believe in large part it's due to financing. Not, not that he can't get the financing, but due to the, due to the economics of the project. Uh, there may be another small hitch that's part of it, but um, I can't believe that, uh, that that he wouldn't be putting a project together, and a lot of other developers for that matter. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out, and I, I hope this is the last thing, in the proposal that was, uh, the proposal, one of the recommendations that I believe was put forth by the principal group after maybe they got some input from the town, but I, I, don't, I don't think it was a very good proposal, and I really wish this would stick out in people's memory, this idea of reducing the parking requirement to three quarters of a parking space, and if anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, three quarters of a parking space per unit, not per bedroom, but per unit. So you could build, and, and I'm speaking hyperbole, but you could build 30 10 bedroom apartments and be required to put 22 or 23 parking spaces there. Now nobody's gonna build 10 bedroom apartments to build one or two or sometimes three bedroom apartments. And that, that could create a congestion problem for one of our biggest ass, assets in Freeport, and that's our, our, our retail. We do know there's a surplus of parking most of the time, but we've got to be very careful about that. The ordinance, I believe, states that if you used shared parking, it's three quarters of a space. If you used exclusive parking, it's one space per, per unit. And I really believe that has to be very, very seriously considered and, and addressed. Um, you know, because it's going to create a big congestion problem down the road and, cr and create unintended consequences. So thank you for all the work everybody's done. I'll leave it at that for tonight. Thanks, Jay. You're welcome. Is there anybody on Zoom who's begging to speak? I, I don't see any hands up on Zoom. Um, while you're looking, one thing I've heard that I'm curious about is I heard one suggestion that says um, give it to the Project Review Board and let them come back with a draft to react to. Another sort of competing suggestion was build a small working group, maybe with two people from each of the boards, to come up with a draft to give people to re something to react to. Feedback on either of those? Ed? Yeah, I, I, uh, do you have a microphone? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think the project review board does a great job, so this is not this, but I also see process as being uh, suffocating in this town, and that if we, like we did with the sewer committee, if we could cut through the process requirements, let project review participate as a lead in the uh, effort to bring all the others together, but the what work for the sewer committee was to have pe people from each of the little silos come together and start the conversation there so you, you didn't go through iteration after iteration after iteration. And the time, we did it in two months, and I'm not going to applaud the sewer committee because what's happened since, but it's, uh, 
it, it, the project worked and the, and the process worked because everybody knew that what they had to say was important and would be listened to and um, go to a product that could be presented out for public comment soon. I concur. I think to have representatives from each of the groups, we're here because some other groups were concerned about our idea here. We're the last vote on anything in town. And so the idea of us reviewing our own work I, is fine, but I think it'll be more balanced and hopefully more productive if representatives from each board can get together. Eric, you want? Sure, um, Eric Smith. Um, I live at um, uh, 7 8 True Street. Um, I want to echo Councillor Egan's uh, comment that it seems like we're all pulling in the same direction. Uh, a lot of us participated in the Downtown Vision program long before even the Design Review Week, participated in the walk, participated in the questionnaire. The Many of us who were the same people that said housing is the number one priority are also the people saying we want the downtown to maintain its historic New England character, which is why in the Downtown Vision report, those are one in the same. It is the same recommendation. New England, village, character, and housing. And one of the things that Russ said in that final report in his presentation was, great, now that you've done all this work, you figured out what you want and what you want it to look like, get it into the ordinance. Because if you don't, you're gonna end up with buildings that look like every other building in every other town because that's what the materials are cheap for and what's what the designs are available for and that's what you're gonna be presented with. And I have watched the Project Review Board struggle for the last year and a half dealing with the fact that the, everybody wants the downtown vision or at least everyone has some level of consensus around the downtown vision but it hasn't been put into the ordinance. So I'm glad to see the urgency. I'm glad to see that there is this, this new push to get it done, uh, because if we had started it right after this report came out, we'd be almost done with an 18-month process. Um, so uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm glad to see all of you together. I'm glad to see that we're moving forward. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, I, th I think that some of what has happened after the vision process, as we've all been trying to operationalize that, has ruffled a lot of feathers. And I think a lot of us came into this room tonight expecting some adversarial um, conversation. And I think what this has proved again is that when we all get together and actually talk with each other, uh, we can all be moving in the same direction and we can do this as a community. So thank you very much for making that happen. Well said, Eric, thank you. Thank you. I have a quick one if it's yeah. okay. Um, if I've got a couple nuts and bolts um, ideas if, we, if we're going to move in the direction we're discussing. Um, I think the, within the town structure, probably the planning board would be the best group to take the lead on this, but that, that can be discussed. Um, if this is going to move quickly, the, the council should approve the funding to get an attorney on this who can really be responsive, an attorney who has done has seen this in other towns. It, the, the window to the out to the rest of the world is going to be very helpful in my mind. So it, that's going to be a costly process to get an attorney who can move at this pace with us. And the last point is on the notion of window and the rest of the world. Andy's idea about a developer, maybe someone from uh, Merida or a Greg Boulos type or someone who sees what's going on in all these other towns might give us some perspective as well. I guess I'm still, I, I want to be sure leaving this meeting what the expedited process is targeting and if the expedited process is just the process faster or if it's a new process that's running in parallel with the process that we're, we've been talking about for quite a while. Because if it's parallel, I see a real issue with taking the resources that have already been planned for in running the process that we've been talking about. And admittedly, I mean, you know, I think, um, I think it was Brett or maybe Dan who said, so, you know, the town staff 
is r really stretched at this point. And yes, we should absolutely hire a consultant. We identified that quite a long time ago that we should hire a consultant. And really, we need to get the RFP out the door. We know that it's a procurement problem. It's a volunteer hours problem. These are the thing. Nobody wants this process to take 12 to 18 to 24 months, right? It, we, we want it to go as fast as possible. My concern is that if we try to start a second process to take to do some sort of emergency fix, we're taking resources away from that first process that we've already identified. So I, to me, it seems either we do an emergency fix, that's a quick fix that identify, that, that solves a particular issue that the town has, uh, has been identified in the vision process. You know, personally, I don't support just a, a, repeal, a temporary repeal of the, um, of the design review ordinance. I have always sort of had a soft spot for the design review ordinance, even though I live in it and I can't change my front door without a permit, which I have, don't worry. Um, but I think, you know, I, I do wanna just be clear about what, what process we're talking about. And if it's, if it's just doing the process but faster and using the momentum from this meeting and, and hopefully building on that and just getting it done as fast as we can, I think that's great. But I, I am really hesitant to get into a middle ground. So that's my... Can I just... I, I don't think it's possible to do a, a, a patch. I just don't really know how you could do it. So but, I think the only yeah. choice is the process faster. And the process faster, one of the biggest things is the public procurement process. And I don't know if you're bound by law here. We have, a, I mean, we have an obvious consultant that has worked with the town and is halfway done with the work. And I'm not sure why we have to have a public process. That may be law, and so that's super important. Uh, but that's one of the biggest um, delays. Absolutely. That's yeah. four months right there. Maybe worse. Right. I think it's, you know, if we could in, uh, with, put together a working group, hire a consultant in two weeks because we liked their proposal that they, you know, absolutely, this could happen really quickly. I think it is, and my understanding of the public process is nowhere near where Caroline's is, so I would defer to her for any particulars, but I think that really is the bottleneck here. I mean, it, it's, you know, we... Do, okay, you, mic, microphone. Well, <laughs> Chip? Yeah. Okay. You know, I can, we, can we start the process and then while we're looking for a consultant and say, here, this is where we've gone so far, are we on the right track? And, and maybe we find out we don't really need a consultant. But, we, you know what I mean? Do it kind of in <coughs> parallel and let's get our working group together you guys did with the sewer because I think we know what we need to do and I think most of the time when we work with consultants we know what we need to do they just help everyone kind of focus is what their job is so Sam I, I think what's happening is you know you guys have these onerous public participation process onerous in the sense they take a lot of time and they go on and on and they're for good reason and certainly we would want public participation in anything that you come up with. We're not talking about making decisions here. We're talking about advisory recommendations to be made to the council with respect to changes in an ordinance that the council has identified as critical to the development of a process that's been going on for three years. It's not starting now and going on. It's the continuation of the effort that the town's been engaged in with lots of people, lots of consultants, lots of money and lots of effort from everybody. And I don't see any reason why we can't bring that to a point through this recommendation about a working group that would make recommendations based on everything that was put into it um, and then some public participation to get some feedback on that. Let the council decide about whether it wants to make changes in this ordinance. And that could be done very quickly. Wayne on Zoom. Wayne, if you're there and you want to try and participate, we'll see if we can make that happen. So go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Fantastic. Okay, go. Great. great. First of all, I'm on the planning board. I apologize for not coming in person tonight. Um, but it was a great discussion, and I love all the knowledge and intelligence in this community. I love the report for that, for that reason. Um, the one thing that just surprised me a little bit is this discussion didn't seem to be um, in the nature of dealing with an emergency or 
crisis. We have a housing crisis. And we're all lucky enough to live in this town, but there's lots of people that should have the opportunity to live in this town and simply don't. And I thought there'd be more of a focus on that. Um, you know, the project review issues, the downtown vision issues, are important normally, but those are not the obstacles, you know, because we've heard that they haven't been rejecting anybody. So I agree with my fellow board member, Andy Arsenault, that we should be focusing on the applicant more. What, what, is, what are the nuts and bolts of the disincentives to develop in Freeport? Because we really need development. So I would advocate for you know, concrete identification of the factors that keep developers away from Freeport and what it would take to get them here. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Matt, can you use our microphone by you? Yep. <clears throat> Uh, just to piggyback off that, I mean, this has been a great debate on the first recommendation, but I think the first few slides that, that Brett walked us through really show that we do have a housing problem and we have an affordability problem and we have a mismatch between the people we want to incentivize to work in our town and do the jobs for our town and where they can live. And these, the things that we're talking about are going to solve development problems but it doesn't give us a targeted goal of what type of housing we need, at what price points, at what densities, in what locations. And until we have, until we come up with a plan as to, okay, we're gonna need 100 of this unit, 100 of that type of unit, how can, how can we put anything else in place to incentivize developers to come in? I mean, if there's no plan as to where we're trying to go, how do we give a carrot to a developer by opening up a TIF district and saying, here's this incentive, because we just have no idea where we're going. So we could use the next few months while we're doing the design review process and come up with a targeted plan to say, this is the type of housing we need, these are the price points, these are the areas that could work, and what do we have to do to change ordinances, what do we have to do to offer incentives, who do we have to target, how do we, how do we get this process going, because that speaks to the affordability and the actual inventory problem as much as our ordinances and the design review process, in my opinion. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing to note is, you know, as a town, we've permitted almost 200 units of multi-unit housing in the last three years, maybe. Uh, 144 of those were at Cross Street by Exit 20, where it's not downtown, design review doesn't apply, land is a little cheaper. Um, so it's easier to develop outside of downtown. Um, there are projects in the works now for affordable housing outside of downtown. If we wanna see more affordable housing in downtown or otherwise, it's probably going to require the subsidies that, that Matt's talking about, whether they come from the town or from the state or from some combination. Um, and I think that's what Brett is eyeing as, as one of the uses for the, the transit-oriented uh, TIF that he's been talking about. Um, so just to kind of um, give us a way forward, we talked about a, a working group that might work with a consultant to work on some issues with design review ordinance. Council's already appropriated some money for design review ordinance work and has appropriated a separate pot of money uh, for some process work as well. Um, so to, to, uh, regarding the procurement, there are policies in town that are largely town policies, but they're there because the spirit of spending town money is that we should consider alternatives. Um, so I don't think we, those need to be lengthy processes. Um, but it seems like that seems to be the consensus of the room, right? Get a small working group together. So we'll be asking for volunteers from at least the four groups represented here tonight, uh, plus some more. I think the idea of having an attorney uh, and, and a developer sound like good ones as well. Uh, so unless there's objection to that, I would suggest that we do that um, and we empower that group to make a recommendation on a consultant to hire to help them move things forward. Uh, in addition to that, I think we need to look at the affordable housing and figure out how we want to deal with that. I think Matt, Matt's point doesn't just in involve uh, subsidized housing. That, that's a, where's the subsidy from? That's a whole other conversation. But there are missing housing types in town, mm -hmm. and I think we could document that, and I don't think we really have. And it'd be very interesting to say, you know, what is the array of housing available in Falmouth, in Brunswick, and how does that compare to the array of housing here? And I'm pretty sure you're gonna find a hole in 1,500 to 2,100 square foot dwelling units. 
And that's, you know, that at least starts to a process. That, that sounds like a separate process to me than the design review rewrite. It is. Right? It yeah, is. Yeah. But it, it's so what do we do a about key that? ingredient to the yeah. comp plan. Yep. yep. A new committee. <laughs> a new committee. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan yeah. just one, one yeah. suggestion, too, is you mentioned the stakeholders in this process. You mentioned the housing committee, this town council, project review board, planning commission, planning board. Um, the Board of Appeals is also part of this process, too. I wonder if they should also be engaged as well, because they are stakeholders. It's a, just throwing it out there. Um, if we can make more changes for streamlining if we broaden out the target beyond just design review, if we mm -hmm. leave, us, leave, leave the latitude to go into subdivision, staff approvals, mm -hmm. and so forth. Which I think, Sam, that's part of the work you're already doing. Yeah. yeah. To streamline the process would include things like that. Yeah. yeah. And there is, like you mentioned, there's the, that additional pot of money for yeah. help with yeah. that. So the one thing, the one gap that I'm hearing that we haven't seemed to come up with a solution for yet is that thing that Matt and Mitch are talking about, about how do we address that missing middle of housing and create a target and figure out how to solve that. Is it to your expect, oh, you, you want an answer? I, I know if somebody has one, that's awesome. I don't have an answer. Um, I know John here, Matt here, you guys might know more about this. Um, John, do you have something on that topic? Or Go ahead, Matt. I think if there could be a, a charge to the housing committee to look at that issue, um, to continue our work and continue meeting, just as a more specific thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. I think that would be fine. That sounds good, too. And I mentioned earlier uh, we had a Muskie School intern, uh, Caroline. Haven't had a chance to look at it. She sent us some production goals today for different things. Um, so that might be a good starting point uh, in terms of identifying how to, how to target opportunities. The assessor's database has a lot of that data, so we just need to... I mean, I shouldn't say we just, but that's an easy place to start to get a, a look at the typology in the community and compare it to others. But um, to, to get at what, what Matt was saying, I think that that's a, in my opinion, that's a subsequent effort um, after we know sort of wh how, to, how to sort of get the wheel turning. Um, in, in my opinion, the town could focus on building 500 affordable housing units tomorrow, and it wouldn't be enough. The state is 20,000 behind uh, where most real estate metrics are, are measuring. Um, so that, I'm, I don't, I guess I, I would agree for sure that we could, that we need to quantify it, and we could quantify it, and there are plenty of comparable metrics of a town of 8,000 people or 8,200 or whatever we have here, you know, could and should have at least this profile of affordable rentals. Chip and I were talking on the way over here about what does it take to get the market to actually produce that. Things have been broken with the market in Maine for a while in terms of land cost and shortage of supply as well as labor, which drives cost up and developers are gonna go where they can make a margin, so they just move up the market. And um, so that, that, that's a, a factor that we're, we're not gonna fix with just a supply issue, for sure. But we don't even get to that if we don't have any supply. So um, is it possible that the chairs of each of those four committees or so submit two names of participants from their boards uh, <laughs> and we make an appointment on the September 5th meeting to convene the group and kick it off. Let's get going. Is it your expectation that the council will come up with a, a charge and breadth and scope of work on this design review ordinance group? Or is it something that the group itself would, after a meeting, would come up and talk about? Yeah, I don't want to speak what, on... What one would expect to accomplish in a given time. Yeah, I can't speak on behalf of the whole council. My, my own personal opinion is that I would really want to hear from that group. I'm, I know I'm not the expert in that area, so I'm not going to be raising my hand to sit on that group. Um, so I'd be really curious to, to hear what, 
what you all, what I'll say. Yeah, Linda. Um, yeah, I I happen to have town council minutes from uh, November 29th, 2022, where it was the. Um, I'll just read it to you, to consider action relative to establishing a housing task force, which has been the impetus of getting to this point. And it said, be it ordered that a housing task force be established to exist for a period of 12 months to study the problem of housing affordability in Freeport and to make recommendations to the town council for actions the town could take and policies the town could establish to encourage the development of affordable housing. And I'd just like to say this was the impetus to create this committee. It has done much of that, but it has also seemed to have you know, gone in a wider circle, and I think that's where we're here tonight. But the suggestion to make sure we have um, affordable housing uh, as a consideration has already been put forward, and I think that's part of the job that should be going on with this committee. Uh, Jim? <laughs> As to try to understand the charge of, of what this committee does, I think there is some value to, to get some guidance because I think there's, there's some different views about the degree to which um, a subjective measure is important to this process versus a point of view that we should be eliminating subjectivity. Without some direction, I, I think this committee ultimately will be putting forward likely two different proposals. Like this is the version that it looks like you know, with subjectivity pulled out. This is the version put forward with subjectivity limited or changed. So um, I recognize that it's kind of hard to necessarily make that decision at the outset, but some direction will be important for this group to be able to you know, hone in on making the, the preference work. Um, again, I understand the concern. I, I trust the committee. You know, let them let them go. It's not, they're not going to take too long to get to that point. If they come up with two different recommendations, they haven't been very useful. Um, but my guess is that if you put these people that, from these different boards together in a room, we, we lock them in a room <laughs> with with the goal of repairing the ordinance and limit it to that, not affordable housing, not all the whole range of comprehensive plan concerns that are going to be addressed by this town and the planning board over time. Just get to the repair of, of the death on review ordinance. You won't find, I, I'm going to guess, the uh, degree of uh, divergence that you expect. Well, let, let's do this. We, we've got November 5th is our next council meeting. September 5th is our next council meeting. Um, and the idea to, uh, for the council to sort of coalesce this committee and, and ask the chairs of each of the four boards to appoint two nominees sounds like a good one. And maybe at that meeting, we can also um, develop maybe a broad charge. Um, and if anybody has ideas on what should be included or excluded, um, by all means, let me know before the fifth. Um, but I, I, like I said, I think there's a spirit of giving that committee some latitude uh, to do some stuff, but also trying to point them in the right direction. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I'm, I still, I think it makes me wonder if the, the committee is the design ordinance emergency review committee, or if the, and, and maybe there's that committee, and then is there also just the housing downtown committee and how does that differ from the existing housing committee and how i mean i can see this going in a couple of different ways still um and i think one one potentially productive path is to identify uh that housing downtown committee or that maybe it maybe be better to call the design review committee that is the goal is to shepherd through these fixes to the design review district at with the help of consultants, sort of the extension of the process that we've already been working on, and do that as quickly as we can. We're going to need people working on that. Maybe it's part of the same, maybe we just combine it and we have one, so that, so that while the consultants are being identified, there can be a, if there, you know, there can be a discussion about what the, the, the town thinks without any consultant input, but based on the knowledge that we already have as a community, what people think the design review ordinance should look like, 
maybe that discussion happens, maybe an emergency fix comes out of that, maybe it doesn't, um, and maybe we just you know, continue with the process. But I, I guess I just, I still see a couple of ways this can go, and I look forward to the, you know, the council's deliberations on it. Um, I don't mean to suggest in any of this that, you know, we need to sort of plot along at this, you know, 12 to 18 month or whatever it is pace. You know, I'm all for expediting processes where we can. Um, so. Dan, what would you think if before the next council? Sorry. <laughs> What would you think if before the next council meeting, since everyone's willing to volunteer, we get <laughs> the chairs of the different committees that are here tonight with council leadership and come up with a plan to bring forward for consideration by the council at the September 5th meeting? That, that's, I think it's a great idea. I was just going to suggest that to Sam, saying you know this is shouldn't derail the work you're already doing, should right. mesh with it. So if we could sit down and figure that out before the 5th, um, I think that'd be great. Uh, I assume you're, you're game for that. John's bringing pizza. Yeah, I was just going to say, who's bringing the pizza? John. John's bringing the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're a little after eight, but we're pretty good for a town meeting. Um, it, anything that people really feel they urgently need to get in before we adjourn for the night? I apologize if I didn't get to anyone's comments. Um, and I do want to make one, one comment. Um, I acted surprised when, when Wayne called in from Zoom and, uh, and on Zoom and we could hear him. And I shouldn't be surprised because Tom and his crew have been working here since last night to get all these wires set up and cameras and things. So. It's, it's not just here either. It's a town hall. Yeah. All the meeting. And I mean, he's it's doing always amazing. Two meetings tonight. Voice comes over the speakers. And it's yeah. like, I watch other town meetings just yeah. so I can gloat about how good our, yeah. <laughs> our, our setup is. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the committees. Thanks for the public. Thanks for being engaged. Thanks for volunteering or being volunteered.